opportunity in their Celtic Manor, um, the excellent restaurants they have, that um, we could use the local supply chain. We have lots of um, you know, local produce from farms on the road, and I'd like to see that, um, that supply chain tapped into. Um, just, just my reaction to that is I, I agree, and when I met with the, the guys from Celtic Manor, they were very open to discussions like that. So I, I think we're pushing that open door. I really agree on that front. On that, uh, we'll conclude. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. A very exhaustive round there, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to the leader of the council. We'll now, we'll now go on to the witnesses, and our fir first witness is Elizabeth Davy, our concerned resident.
know we are still having the emerging planning for ourselves, but nevertheless, the Elizabeth, balance of things. Elizabeth, I am enjoying listening to you. One more could, you could you wind up I that hope Our panelists have yet to tell us, but I feel sure they will be supportive with that. So I'm just concerned at the unwisdom of investing all that money in a scheme that may not.
Is it not an SBI because the protection that that will afford the site is creating a barrier for developer to overcome? Cabinet employs circular arguments to justify itself. Receipts can be used to build a new access road. You've got one minute left, John. Right. Development of world's Docklands would meet all of the 2020 pledges. Docklands could be regenerated over and over again. The land is not poor quality. It's, clocked, it's uh, classified by the Soil Association as being moderate for, for fertility to highly productive. Two thirds of the community do not support the resort. Council received 1,400 responses to its survey, 1,311 were in direct opposition or stated doubts. The site is home to the Blacktail Godwits. It could be a triple SI. Why is it not an SBI? Because it would be a, 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 a constraint upon the, the developer. Thank you, Chairman and Committee, for giving me this time. It's not easy to compress 15 years of research into a five-minute speech. This is the 7th of December. In 1941, it was a date of infamy. This could be a date of infamy if the wrong decision is made for the Green Belt. Thank question, you, gentlemen? Could you just stay for a second? Would anybody like to ask any questions? Expand on the concept of uh, the revenue not going off the resort. Fine. First of all, golf resorts are toxic to the natural environment and they're toxic to the uh, local economy. Um, my aim was to uh, make my offer the best that there was in the vicinity. People wouldn't want to go anywhere else. People would come to my resort and stay there. All of this business you've heard about the about conference. Uh, money and people spending money in the restaurant. Where do you think the profit goes? The profit goes into the pocket of the developer. It doesn't go outside the borough. The people who come to the resort won't leave the resort. And if they do, they'll be doing it for what we used to call, uh, when I was uh, in the business, reciprocal play arrangements, whereby uh, I, as the golf resort owner, developer, would make a reciprocal arrangement with a nearby golf course that had perhaps hosted an Open a couple of years ago, and uh, perhaps an Englishman had uh, won the Open there. And instead of paying £250 uh, to play the course, we would, uh, they would offer my punters £50 to play. That £50 covers the cost of running the golf course for the day. But the point is, those punters would then spend their money in that restaurant that's on, on the uh, resort. None of the income that's on, that is, none of the expenditure on the resort leaves the resort except in pay. And those jobs, they are not, uh, uh, what did you call them, uh, uh, training jobs? John, John, I think you've answered that question. Okay, you're fine. Okay, thank you. You're repeating yourself there. Julian, do you really want to ask a question? <laughs> really for me it's perhaps a difference between the golf resorts that you were developing and the Celtic Manor resort that I've seen in South Wales. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know you would have to go to the Celtic Manor resort because mm -hmm. it's really only the M4 that passes um, along the side of it. Um, so you are um, um, you, you are actually on that resort and there wouldn't be anywhere else to go which is different to where Holy Lake is. And the other thing that I would dispute with you is that you say you've used brakes and some of the, um, some of perhaps our local um, pubs would use brakes as sort of, you know, freeze-dried fruit, food and pre-processed food. No, it food. doesn't at all. But what I would say to you is that having used the Celtic Manor, if they use the same ethos here, which I would hope that they would, um, they very much thrive on using local produce. That's one of their main key things that they, that um, one of their key assets, I suppose. And um, I wouldn't see why that would differ here. In fact, to come to Holy Lake, it would, um, you're actually
actually come into an area. So I think that the other bed and breakfast places and the other shops are going to benefit from people who decide to come off the resort because there'll be lots of other things to go to, which is completely different to the Celtic Manor situation. Thank you, John. Can I answer that, Jim? Yes, could you be very brief? Yeah, I don't, very, I don't understand. Uh, the whole point of a golf resort is to stay on resort. It doesn't matter whether it's Celtic Manor uh, beside the M4 or whether it would have been one of mine in Cheshire or one of mine in Scotland. Okay, John, you've answered that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? No. I'm disappointed.
states, development should provide open access to the countryside for the urban population. Golf is elitist and will deny access to the majority. This resort meets neither of the two UDE themes of continued urban regeneration and protection of the green belt. I believe this proposal is a con. It is a private hotel and luxury housing development. The golf aspect is merely cover for developing in the green belt. Jobs and tourism potential are used as a smokescreen to disguise major negative impacts. Five star resorts are designed so that the tourist money stays in resort. The only beneficiaries are the developers who make a massive profit at the expense of local people and the environment. Why is the golf resort the only option? There is massive unlocked potential on the Mersey waterfront, which is a world class location looking out over the internationally famous Liverpool skyline. Martin Mir provides 91 jobs, has 200,000 visitors per well, year, right. and injects 6 million into the economy. <clears throat> this resort is to provide 170 mostly low paid jobs. In three years, the Reach Out Partnership helped 2,000 people find jobs. In one year, the Royal Chamber of Commerce helped create 970 new jobs. There are so many problems and risks with this project. Capus's previous report stated, it is professional view of the consultant team that the very special circumstances required to overcome green health policy could not easily be substantiated. We don't need further reports and surveys. The information is already there to prove that there are no very special circumstances related to this project. It is financial madness to proceed with this project. The money could be far more wisely spent to achieve better outcomes in jobs and tourism. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and thanks for keeping me for the last five minutes. Would anybody like David? Good afternoon. Um, I must confess I was fascinated, and I've been fascinated about some of the other speakers as well, because I have a very good friend who used to run the Belfry in, in the Midlands, and, and the point that was raised about uh, there being a bit of a desert around uh, is, is a point well made, uh, because people do keep it in, in the resort. Um, I am fascinated, obviously, with your professional background, are you suggesting today that, in effect, this is money being thrown away because planning will not be, in your opinion, uh, agreed? I am, yes, in my opinion it won't be agreed, and in, in the opinion of Capita in the previous reports, they said there is a very high risk that the, the very special circumstances needed it just can't be substantiated. So you, you spend £600,000 to bring the development forward and then when you come to planning, whether it gets referred to the Secretary of State or not, there's a massive chance that Same circulation, five minutes, and I'll let you know when, when you've used that call. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't want any statements to make, but I'm quite happy to answer any um, questions on the report that went to the Cabinet. David, if you'd like to start. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I did put a question, as you all know, as leader of the Council, David. Um, in the event that the Planning Commission is refused, or refused following a government calling, which I think almost refers to what Karen has been talking about, what mechanisms are in place for sharing the cost of the development and the preparatory work incurred to that date? That's one question. Maybe better if I ask the three brief questions. Yes, the second one was, when we are so short of funds, is it prudent to allocate so many funds to this venture by putting all our eggs in one basket. And the third one, if the plug is pulled by the council, is it possible for council to recover any of the funds contributed to that date, or are they lost forever? Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'll, I'll try and answer those uh, questions. Um, in 
terms of the fees that have been put in today, there's the 237,000 that comes through, and there's the 595,000. Um, because of the way that the project is now structured and that, the site of that would not be recoverable should this project fail. It has to be seen as an investment in taking this project forward. Um, the way that the next stage of the process will be, so we've come through and we've pulled the land together. Um, we have now negotiated a development agreement, which is the document that sets out the framework of how we're going to work on this project as it moves forward. And then the next stage is this funding and viability plan, which the developer has to prepare. And then we, as the council, have to assess that. And then we've got the absolute discretion as a council we're not satisfied with that funding and viability plan that we can stop the project at that point. Um, the council has made investments so far in the project, which is 0.4% if you have the two figures together, uh, against the £190 million pounds investment. Uh, the Jack Nicholas Joint Venture Group is putting in somewhere in the region of about £1.25 million. Pounds their own money to take the project through these processes and then through to planning. So both parties, if you like, are making contributions towards uh, the development of this project, which is being taken forward in stages. Um, in terms of the question that Councillor Alderson asked about putting all the funds in one basket, I'm not quite sure I fully understand the question there. I mean, this is. £190 million pound project that the council um, has made decisions to invest in to seek to take that forward. This is not the only regeneration project, of course, that the council is currently engaged in or putting um, support into. So, you know, we've got the Will Waters project, the Birkin Head work, the work you do down in Bromley at the International Business Park, um, and, and, and so on. So, I don't see this as putting all the funds in one basket. This is just one of a number of key regeneration projects that the council is trying to drive forward at the moment to create jobs, employment, investment, and you know obviously uh, council tax returns and business rate returns uh, for the benefit of the communities of Will and Reserve. So, that's the question. In response to that, can I just make another brief response, please? Um, clearly, uh, people number of people have alluded to the fact that um, the company, Jack Nicholas company, doesn't seem to have an awful lot of clout behind it. So are you saying you're relying on Celtic Manor? That's the first part of that question. And the second part really is the funding, it may only be 0.4% or whatever it is of the total cost of development, but it's still an enormous amount of money yeah. for, to be allocated to one particular project. And as you know, and we've discussed this previously, David, I am totally favour in principle of the idea of doing this, but I'm very concerned that as time progresses at the increasing costs and problems that might arise as a result of going as far as we're going. So the final question to that was, you already said that we've probably lost the 240 or 50,000 or whatever it is, if it was to go that yet. Are you also saying that if this additional funding of 600 odd thousand is allocated, if it goes belly up, we would also lose that? Because what it would mean is that if we didn't go to planning, if there were some problems on the way that it caused either party to pull out, can you possibly get any of this money back from a joint venture body who don't seem to have any clout at all behind them? I'm just bothered. I'm not bothered about the development. I'm happy with the idea. I've built golden resorts myself. I was involved in development actually. So let's just be clear where I'm coming from on this. I'm not against it in principle. I'm very, very concerned on a non particle basis on the amount of council taxpayers' money we are putting at risk. And I need that clarification that there is a chance, quite clearly, that we can lose the 250 odd thousand we've spent and the 600,000 and there'll be no mechanism, legal mechanism, for recovering it. That <coughs> causes me great concern. Okay. Um, in terms of answering those questions, the way that this project will be funded will be probably from a number of sources. So we have the Nicholas Joint Venture Group as 
they lead a uh, company on this. Um, but there will be funding coming into the project uh, from corporate finance sources, um, from likely to be the Celtic Land Organisation, from the house builders that will come in as part of this scheme for the enabling development. So in the next stage of the project, what we'd expect funding and viability plan to set out is the costs and the funding and where that's coming from. And we'll be looking for uh, details around uh, the guarantees on that funding, the certainty of that funding and so on. So I think at that point, the council will be able to take a view on the whole of the project and the funding sources that are going into it from there. So this is not a case of just dealing with an organisation like the Nicholas Joint Venture Group who are only small, but you know, you know the way that the development market works and you set up organisations like this to take the project forward to a certain point, but then all the major institutional funders and others come in to create the funding package to enable the development to happen. So what is happening here is not different to the way hundreds of other developments have been done in the past, and it's just the way that you do them on, on a step-by-step um, the money, uh, I think has already been said this afternoon, it is a significant amount of council money that is going into this project. Um, it is only 0.4% of the total uh, project cost of approximately £190 million. Can I just explain that that funding is going in to specific things? So the money uh, that is part of this report is going into specialist consultant fees um, that the council needs to support and provide advice on the Golf Resort project because we don't have that specialism and that commercial approach and all of those other skills in-house because we don't do projects like this, obviously, um, every day of the week. Uh, so it is going into those costs that we actually need for consultancy. Uh, there's some legal fees in there. The council does own and has responsibilities for any liabilities that come from the landfill site that we have in Hoyle. And so, as a council, and being responsible, we would have to make sure that there are no issues from that landfill site, whether we did the Golf Resort project or not. We have several other landfill sites across the world, as you may know, where we have those responsibilities. So some of that money would have to go into making sure that there were no um, issues um, there around that. Um, coming on to the, um, the, the money back situation, um, the project is progressing at the moment with both parties investing money in taking the project to the funding and viability stage, as I've explained. And that's the crucial phase for this project because uh, at that point, all of the financial arrangements and everything are documented and assessed. Um, if the project doesn't proceed beyond that point, then my understanding at the moment is the investment that the council has put in uh, will not come back to it. Equally, the investment that the Jack Nicholas Joint Venture Group has put in um, will not come back to them either. So, with any project, as you know, there are always risks in taking those projects forward. What we're attempting to do here on behalf of the council, because this is a major project, it's a complex project, we're trying to do it in stages so that we um, limit and mitigate the risks of the council at every stage as we, we take it forward. And so we look very carefully at the costs and we have assessed those at each stage um, and taken those things forward from there. So that is likely to be the outcome if this project um, doesn't happen. Both sides, if you like, will have costs that they won't be able to recover. The alternative to that is if we don't invest these sums of money now in enabling the development work to be done on the project, the project will not happen at all. And there's just no way it would progress.
leave some of the money going in are significant. What I don't envisage is the requirement for the council to put any more money into the fees for the consultants or the legal work that we're doing at the moment. Because when we get on to the next stage, there are other mechanisms to do that. So um, I don't envisage a situation where we're coming back and asking for any more fees to take the project forward. Because from here on in, if the funding viability assessment is satisfactory to the council, it's agreed, then all of those costs then will drop off onto the developer. I hope that answers the question. Is that okay? Have I missed anything? Just a very quick question. It doesn't quite do it. My, my concern is, David, that if this thing falls flat on its face and doesn't get planning or doesn't proceed, these corporate bodies who you say are anxious to invest in it will disappear over the horizon very quickly. I'm wondering what mechanism you're going to get to get any of the funds back from them when they, when we've already provided those funds. They're not going to want to give us money back for what we spend out on their behalf if everything fails. That's the concern I've got. I, I don't know I'm making myself <coughs>
is sign the development agreement that's the subject of this report um, as quickly as possible. And then uh, within approximately three months of that, so as the leader of the council said, by approximately March of next year, we would expect to see all of that detail for the funding and viability plan back in with the council. Now, between now and then, we will have to spend some additional money on our con specialist consultancy support to take the project forward to that funding and viability phase. The work around the site investigation, so that's the um, 200,000 and the fees for the remediation strategy, wouldn't all have to be spent at day one. So probably what would happen is we'd move through with the consultancy fees, we'd be getting the funding and viability plan, and we'd assess that, and then we'd look at the detail around the site investigation and other So we wouldn't be spending everything at, at the first goal, it would be over time. But why this report is asking for approval for those figures now is that we're working on the basis that you know we will have to progress to that stage. And what we wanted to do with members was one, make the position very clear, but two, make sure that that funding um, was secured because once we move in, we, you know, it needs to move on to the next stage uh, from there. So I hope that helps, Chair. It does, it does, David, thank you. And um, Dave. Thank you, Chair.